Okay. Um, it says the meeting is live streaming now, so uh, go ahead, uh, Lorraine, and let's see if we get the echo. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for the Sunday Forum. We're very glad to share our forum with you this morning. So my name is Lorraine, and I'm going to be reading just a bit about um, the forum and what it is with a few announcements. And then um, our host for today, Mark Miller, will introduce our speaker. So first of all, the story of forum. The meeting is live streaming now, so uh, go ahead, uh, Lorraine, and let's see if we get. OK, I think see, I got this it. This is how it echoes. Yeah, I think I've got it fixed. Okay. okay. Hello. Keep Good going. morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. And I welcome you to our forum this morning. We're very glad to share the forum with you. I'm good. My name is Lorraine. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you just a bit about the forum. Sunday forums have been part of Sunday morning for over 50 years at First Unitarian Society Milwaukee. All scheduling and hosting is accomplished by volunteers. And the forums support our mission. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. This lecture series showcases provocative and sometimes controversial speakers who review topical issues of the day. Forum topics are the responsibility of the presenters who share their point of view as formed through experience and knowledge. Every forum is not intended to express all sides of the topic nor all points of view and presenters do not receive honoraria. Forums may not always align with the viewpoint of First Unitarian Society Milwaukee, but are meant to introduce thoughtful topics, which our members may pursue further on their own. I'd like to let you know this morning uh, that we do now have closed captioning for people who would appreciate that. There is either a button at the lower um, icon edge of your screen, which is a CC, and you may click on that and follow directions, or you may have more on your uh, choices, and you can click on that. Is that about right, Cherry? That <laughs> okay. sounds good. Sorry, I was over on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, and so we have that. I do want to let you know about our speaker for next Sunday, and that will be April 4th, and it is Sam Goodrich, who's with the Time Slips Project for Older Adults, and the title is Time Slips Engagement Party. So this is a new initiative on their part for um, welcoming in and bringing together um, older adults with other generations. So, and right now, I just turn things over to Mark Miller, who's our host for today for our speaker. Uh, yes, I'd like to welcome uh, Attorney General uh, Josh Call to our forum. Um, I've indicated to him that I'd like him to say anything he wants to about his background. And uh, so we'd like to get started right away. Okay, Josh. Uh, well, thanks very much, Mark and uh, Lorraine, and thank you to everybody for uh, inviting me to join you this morning. It's, it's good to be here. And I want to make sure that we leave um, plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, and I, I think we've set aside 20 minutes for that. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to having that dialogue. Um, so let me start out by, I guess, telling you a little bit about um, my background and the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a few areas that have been uh, priorities of mine uh, during my time as Attorney General. Um, so I guess uh, to start with, I, I grew up in Oshkosh and Fond du Lac, and uh, I grew up in a family that was deeply involved in, in law enforcement. My um, mom, Peg Lautenschlager, was a uh, prosecutor mm -hmm. and elected official. Uh, my stepdad, Bill Ripple, was a police officer with the Nina uh, Police Department. Uh, and my mom's parents were both uh, public school teachers in Fond du Lac. And I had the opportunity to spend part of my career in, in public service as well. I was a uh, federal prosecutor in Baltimore, um, where I worked on cases involving uh, large-scale drug trafficking and gangs and violence and worked to make communities safer. I also spent part of my career uh, working on cases involving challenges to laws that made it harder for people to vote, um, working to expand access to, to voting um, in a variety of states. 
Uh, and I was elected as uh, attorney general in 2018. I am Wisconsin's 45th uh, attorney general. And it is a honor and privilege to serve um, as the head of the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Um, the, I, I like to say that, uh, you know, when I went to elementary school in Wisconsin, there, I think it was third or fourth grade, you learn about state government and you get an overview of uh, how the government process works. But I don't think a lot of people get uh, have a day set aside for the uh, the role of the Wisconsin Department of Justice or what it is that an attorney general does. And, and actually it varies from state by state. The responsibilities that different AGs have uh, are different across the country. Um, so I think a good starting point is just what it is that our Wisconsin Department of Justice does. Um, the short answer is that uh, we are an agency with about 800 employees um, and we are involved in a variety of different issues. Um, we have a division of legal services that I think is what people usually think of when they think of the uh, Department of Justice. Uh, they do a variety of different types of work, including uh, criminal prosecutions in certain cases. Um, we handle all of the criminal appeals in the state. Uh, we also handle a lot of civil cases, cases where the state is, is sued and is a defendant. And that could be uh, something as simple as uh, somebody who's working for the state uh, is involved in an accident and the state is a party to a case. Uh, or it could be something like a challenge to the constitutionality of a statute. Um, we also enforce uh, environmental consumer protection and antitrust laws in the state. Um, and we do a variety of other cases as well. Um, we also have a division of criminal investigation. It's a statewide investigative agency that is charged with investigating crimes of statewide importance. Uh, and they investigate uh, a variety of different types of crime, including uh, large scale drug trafficking, um, homicides or other violent crimes, uh, human trafficking, uh, and a variety of other uh, offenses as well. Um, we have uh, what's called the Division of Forensic Sciences, the state crime labs, where we test a variety of different types of evidence to help uh, provide scientific uh, explanation to facts that happen in a case. And that can involve uh, DNA testing, it can involve fingerprint analysis, uh, it can involve analysis of controlled substances, uh, then we have a, a division of law enforcement services, uh, which does a lot of work with law enforcement agencies around the state. Um, they administer grant programs. Uh, they provide training and work uh, to help set standards for, for law enforcement agencies around the state. Uh, they also do a lot of uh, data collection uh, so that we can better understand um, what's happening with uh, law enforcement uh, around the state. Uh, and they have what's uh, known as the Criminal Information Bureau, which does a, a variety of different types of work, including things like, you know, when, when there's a traffic stop and an officer pulls up information about uh, the, the license plate on the car they stopped and connects it with people, they're the ones who uh, make sure that that system uh, is running smoothly so that there aren't any problems and that the information gets to where it goes. They gather criminal history data uh, and a variety of other things. Um, we then have our internal uh, management division, our division of management services, which works to help coordinate all the operations. Um, we've got an office of crime victim services, which works with victims of crime in Wisconsin and helps support them throughout the process, as well as supporting uh, victims programs across the state. Um, we have an office of open government, which uh, both responds to requests for public records, uh, but also provides guidance on public records issues. And that's been a, a particularly significant issue during the pandemic as governments have been meeting in different ways, uh, but still need to make sure that they're complying with their uh, open records requirements and open meetings requirements. Uh, and then we have an office of school safety, which has worked with schools uh, uh, around the state uh, to try to make sure that they have practices that can keep them uh, as safe as possible. Uh, and then on top of that, we of course are engaged in uh, a, a variety of uh, sort of public issues like communications about the work that DOJ is doing. Um, we work, uh, we have a government affairs director who works with members of the legislature and others to advance uh, legislation that we believe is uh, significant uh, to our agency. Uh, and then we engage with uh, groups like this and uh, law enforcement leaders and public officials and others around the state, um, not only to talk about our work, but to figure out ways that we can partner together to advance uh, the goals of, of our office. Um, so I, I set uh, a mission for the Wisconsin Department of Justice as AG, 
and that is to protect the public and ensure that justice is done. Um, I think that the, fundamentally that captures the work that our uh, approximately 800 employees at DOJ do day in and day out in a variety of different capacities. Uh, and I wanna talk about a few things that I've made um, priorities. First, protecting public safety is our top priority at, at the Department of Justice. We, we do that in a lot of different ways, um, but I wanna touch on just a, a few key ones today. Um, one is that we have worked to strengthen Wisconsin's response to sexual assault. Um, one of the areas where there has been, in my view, under enforcement uh, of the laws is crimes that disproportionately involve violence against women. Um, we've seen congressional action to address that with the Violence Against Women Act, which uh, is now uh, up again for consideration. Uh, but at the state level, I wanna make sure that um, crime, this crime that is currently significantly underreported, sexual assault, is reported um, more consistently. And as part of that, um, that means making sure we are training uh, officials across the state so that they have uh, up-to-date tools and they know the best practices for responding to sexual assault cases. We've also been working through uh, cases that resulted from uh, what, what had previously been a backlog of untested sexual assault kits cases where evidence was collected but hadn't been submitted for testing. Um, we are now prosecuting some of those cases. We've also reviewed a, a number of those cases uh, so that justice isn't uh, going undone in some of those critical cases. I've also advocated for legislation that's designed to prevent Wisconsin from ever having another backlog of, of untested sexual assault mm -hmm. kits. That passed the state Senate in the last session but didn't get a hearing in the assembly. Um, we're hoping that this session, it will be, uh, it will ultimately get across the finish line. It has already passed the state Senate on a voice vote. So it's moving along quickly this session. Um, and so now we need to try to get it passed in the assembly and we'll continue working on that. Uh, another big issue that has impacted public safety is the opioid epidemic. Uh, and that's actually been exacerbated by the pandemic uh, as people have been more isolated and have had more uh, mental health challenges and also uh, substance use disorder has had a bigger impact. Um, there are some aspects of that uh, effort where uh, our enforcement capacity comes in. Uh, for example, trying to fight large-scale drug trafficking. There's been a particular problem recently with fentanyl, which is a uh, especially potent opioid, uh, and even very small quantities can, can lead to overdoses, and it's played a role in hundreds of, of opioid overdose deaths in Wisconsin. So working to slow the distribution of fentanyl into the state is key. Uh, we're also working to hold pharmaceutical companies accountable for the role that they played in the epidemic. Um, we brought suit against uh, Purdue Pharma in my first year as AG. They are now in, in bankruptcy and there are bankruptcy proceedings going on. Uh, we joined a multi-state investigation into opioid distributors uh, who uh, we believe uh, played a role in knowing what was happening with these opioids around the state and could see the patterns and yet failed to take action. And we recently announced a settlement with McKinsey, a consulting company uh, for the role that it played in advising uh, opioid distributors. Uh, that was a, a nationwide settlement uh, and there will be over $10 million coming into Wisconsin to help us work to abate the epidemic. And there are two reasons that that work I think is so important. One is we need to have a clear understanding of what happened to cause this epidemic to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And so we can make sure our response is tailored as effectively as possible. But we also need resources to support the critical work that goes into fighting this epidemic from uh, providing treatment to people who are struggling with substance use disorder to supporting effective enforcement mechanisms to educating people about the dangers of, of opioid addiction. And with, through these cases, it's my hope that we will bring significant resources into the state to support those efforts. We've started to see the results of that, and I think we're going to continue seeing that uh, in the years ahead. Uh, and then another public safety issue I wanted to mention is working to make our system uh, fairer and more equitable and more just. Um, I am a believer that there are changes that we can make to our criminal justice system that will make it more fair and more equitable and also make our communities safer. Um, and I think, you know, we, I'm sure everybody here is aware of some of the disparities that we have uh, in our justice system and the very large number of people that are incarcerated, both nationwide, but also uh, in Wisconsin. And I think uh, if we're smart about how we address this problem, we can 
tackle some of those disparities in ways that make us safer. And I'll give you a, a few examples. I, I talked before about treatment. Um, one thing I think is, is indisputable really is that there are a huge number of people who end up in our criminal justice system uh, because of an addiction to uh, uh, an illegal substance uh, or opioids. There are also a huge number who end up in the system who have uh, mental health challenges. If we can get appropriate treatment to those folks, um, we are gonna have safer communities in the long run and fairer outcomes for those individuals than we will if those folks just end up incarcerated, spend a short period of time in jail, and then return to communities with the underlying issue that led them uh, into the criminal justice system going unaddressed. So expanding access to those sorts of programs is, is something that I'm a strong advocate for. They have expanded um, and, and I hope that they will continue to expand uh, in the budget we have here. Uh, another good example is our bail system. I think our bail system is significantly in need of reform. When I was a federal prosecutor and I'd work on bail ca cases involving pretrial release, the basic test was, was the one that I think a lot of people would come to uh, if they just assumed, made an assumption about how the system would work. Judges looked at whether the person was a danger to the community and whether they were a risk of flight or were likely to show up at, at the hearings. And if the answer was that they were not a risk of flight and they were not a danger, then they were generally released. Uh, and if they were a danger to the community, if you arrested somebody for a very serious crime and you had strong evidence and they had a significant criminal history, they were typically detained pending trial. In the state, as in most states, our system uh, doesn't work that way. It's in part based on cash bail. Uh, so bail is set at a particular financial amount. Uh, and what that can mean is that people who are not that dangerous may end up in jail pending trial because they don't have the resources to pay for mm -hmm. the bail. And on the other hand, you can have people who are very dangerous, but who are able to raise a lot of money or who are very wealthy uh, and they can afford jail. I, I don't think that that's safe. I don't think that that's fair. And I think we can modify our system to uh, to make it more fair and to make it um, better at serving public safety. Um, we could go on about public safety, but um, I want to talk about a few mm -hmm. of the other areas that are, are significant. Um, one is protecting our environment and protecting consumers in Wisconsin from various types of consumer fraud or from um, monopolistic practices that uh, ultimately lead to higher prices and less competition in the market. Um, one of my priorities as AG has been to strengthen our environmental protection and consumer uh, protection uh, elements of our office. And so we combined our environmental protection unit and our consumer protection unit into what we call the public protection unit. Uh, and I'm really proud of the work that that unit has been doing, both going through uh, a backlog of environmental enforcement cases we inherited, uh, but also working both within Wisconsin and on multi-state matters to work to protect consumers. Um, and so just to give you a few examples of some of the things we've, we've done in those respects, um, we were one of uh, many states involved in um, getting debt relief for students who um, have gone to schools that uh, defrauded students, for-profit mm -hmm. um, private schools that engaged in what we allege were false and deceptive marketing practices. Um, there was a merger involving uh, Dean Foods and uh, Dairy Farmers of America that would have uh, limited the uh, number of competitors in that market. And we ensured that a facility in Northeast Wisconsin uh, did not get swept up in that merger, but instead was sold independently so that we could protect competition uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, we've joined multi-state investigations into some large tech companies uh, like Facebook um, to investigate uh, whether it's been engaged in anti-competitive practices. Uh, we've also uh, enforced a number of, uh, uh, enforced environmental laws in a number of different cases, including cases where uh, CAFOs have violated the conditions of, of their permits. Uh, and actually we have a state Supreme Court case coming up uh, in April that's going to involve whether uh, the DNR is both permitted and required to consider the impact of uh, the cumulative impact of high capacity wells uh, on nearby waterways when permits are granted. The opposing position says that the impact on nearby lakes and streams cannot be considered. Uh, our argument, our position is that it must be considered under the state's public trust doctrine. Um, those are just a few examples, but there's an enormous amount of work we do relating to the environment and consumers. 
Uh, and then last, I wanna talk about the defense of uh, our constitutional rights and of uh, voting rights in the state. Um, we are actively involved in, in defending the state when uh, challenges are brought to ways that our elections are administered. We often represent the Wisconsin Election Commission. Uh, so prior to the 2020 election, there was a challenge that sought to uh, remove uh, originally uh, over well over 100,000 voters from the voter rolls to purge those voters. Uh, we defended the uh, decision not to purge those voters. And I personally argued uh, before the state Supreme Court that, that those voters should not be purged. We're still awaiting a, a decision in that case. Um, but um, you know, I, I believe we have the better of the argument and, and we'll see what ultimately happens. Um, we also uh, were involved in a challenge to actions that changed the way the Postal Service uh, operated prior to the election. We joined with other states in arguing that those practices uh, risked disenfranchising voters in an election that we knew was going to use large scale uh, absentee by mail voting. Uh, and we ultimately were successful in um, getting courts to order. And the, we had a case, and there were other cases, but those courts ordered that those uh, policies not go into effect uh, or be reversed prior to the election. And then following the election, we defended the will of Wisconsin voters uh, as a number of different challenges were brought to. Uh, the, the way that Wisconsin's elections were conducted and ultimately uh, courts uniformly uh, rejected those challenges. Uh, going forward, we'll be working um, when we have worked to advocate for a fair redistricting process. Um, I joined Governor Evers when he announced the, the creation of the People's Maps Commission and spoke about mm -hmm. the importance of nonpartisan redistricting. And I, you know, we, we don't know how that process is going to play out yet, but I expect that there will be uh, court action ahead of us uh, regarding regarding those issues. Uh, and we've been involved in a number of other cases involving challenges to federal policies that, in my view, were uh, illegal or unconstitutional and also uh, in, were harmful to uh, people of the state of Wisconsin. Um, so we've challenged changes to environmental rules. Um, we've challenged changes to uh, consumer financial uh, protection bureau policy. Um, we withdrew the state of Wisconsin from a lawsuit that was seeking to invalidate the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and we ultimately submitted a, we joined a brief that supported uh, those who were defending the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. We're still waiting on that decision from the US Supreme Court as well. Um, so I could go on and on um, talking about the, uh, the great work that uh, my colleagues at the Wisconsin Department of Justice do. Um, but you know, that's sort of a high level summary of some of the, the topics we're up to. And I would love to take uh, questions or hear any comments from, from folks. So thanks again for having me. Wow. I bet you feel tired now. You're going to have to go back to bed after you, <laughs> after you heard all the things you do. Uh, we do have a couple questions just to get started. Uh, one comment of uh, appreciation of the um, CAFO's uh, water issue and that it's imp so important for that to be monitored. There is also a question about wolves. Um, uh, specifically, your role in re um, uh, uh, dealing with the uh, hunters from Kansas, the, the overkilling of wolves by people from Kansas. I wonder if you could reply to that. Yeah, I can talk about the issue generally. Um, and I'm not specific off the top of my head with the, the question about folks from out of state, but. Um, I'll, I'll sort of go back a, a couple steps here and, and give a little bit of background here for those who are uh, not as familiar with this issue. But uh, for a period of time, the, um, the wolves were listed as protected under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and uh, I forget exactly when, but uh, at some point, I believe last year, um, the wolf population had reached a point where the, the folks who were making the decisions about what remained on the Endangered Species Act protected list made the decision to delist the gray wolf from, uh, from the list of species that um, were considered protected and, and uh, couldn't be hunted. Um, after that happened, uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources began a process of uh, assessing um, the creation of a, a wolf hunt in Wisconsin. Uh, but very quickly after that, the, the, the change was made in federal uh, policy, a, a lawsuit was brought in the state of Wisconsin, arguing that under Wisconsin law, 
there had to be a wolf hunt that went forward quite promptly. Um, so a suit was filed uh, against the DNR. And one of our roles as the State Department of Justice is to defend state agencies um, when lawsuits are, are brought. So my office represented the DNR uh, in circuit court um, defending against that lawsuit seeking essentially an immediate uh, announcement of a, a wolf hunt. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the court uh, ruled against us and they ruled that uh, the hunt had to go forward and they uh, issued an order saying that, um, that, that the, the process had to go forward immediately. We then appealed that to the Court of Appeals uh, and, the court of, and asked the Court of Appeals to stay that order to stop it from going into effect. Uh, the Court of Appeals also ruled uh, against us and ruled that the hunt had to go in effect. And so DNR, uh, pursuant to the court order, uh, very quickly set up a, a wolf hunt, um, which then took place. There have been a lot of concerns raised about um, the way that that process took place. I, 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 I can't speak for DNR, but they obviously had to scramble in response to a court order mm -hmm. um, that required them to, to set up the hunt. And um, the number of wolves that were ultimately killed um, exceeded the number of that, that DNR had targeted, um, uh, at least for non-Indigenous populations uh, who received licenses. People were required to uh, apply for a license to do the hunt. And um, there, I assume from the question that there is a suggestion that uh, there may have been people who weren't licensed who were hunting, um, but folks who, who were hunting um, without a license would be subject to enforcement action from the DNR. Okay, thank you. Um, Bruce is looking for a few more specifics on your role in redistricting, redistricting that you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. So we have both, um, well, we have, we have a legal role that we're likely to, we've played some and we're likely to play going forward. And then we also have what I would call sort of a policy role. Um, the policy role is, is in my position as attorney general and as a state public official. Um, I advocate for policies that I support. And one of the policies I support is nonpartisan redistricting. I'd like to see Wisconsin ultimately have a model like Iowa has where we have um, a, a fair map system set up and there's a, uh, an actual process that's been set up through legislation and everybody knows what to expect. Um, that you know, is not gonna happen with the current um, uh, legislature that we have, that, that there's gonna be a statute passed. And so I think the process the governor has adopted as an alternative is a very smart one, which is to uh, effectively create the kind of process that we'd like to see created by legislation to have uh, nonpartisan redistricting done by an independent commission. Um, what will happen ultimately is one of two things. Either the legislature and the governor will reach an agreement on maps or they won't, in which case the maps will, will be decided um, by the courts. Um, there has been uh, an action file, not over the substance of what the maps are, but just about what the procedure will be um, for, for how the courts handle redistricting cases. The request in that case was that basically the state Supreme Court immediately take up a review of the maps. Um, now, we submitted uh, comments opposing that request on behalf of the governor's office. Um, so our, that's, that's the role our office has played so far. Um, we argued that it redistricting should go through the normal court process and that uh, it's a complex process and having that before the state Supreme Court would be uh, very difficult to manage. Uh, so we'll see what happens. You know, if, if something is passed that will become law and um, we of course could be challenged, but um, you know, if the governor and the legislature agree on a map, I would think it would likely be uh, a fair map and one that's unlikely to, to be challenged. In the event that we end up in court, and I think that's what a lot of people are expecting, um, our office could be involved in, in a variety of capacities, but we often represent uh, state agencies um, or uh, entities. As I mentioned, we represented the governor's office um, previously. Um, so we will in, in all likelihood be involved in the litigation over what maps should be in place um, in, in one capacity or another as the case moves forward. Um, it's gonna be an, a, a very fast process because uh, the census data isn't going to come out until this fall. And uh, so that's the fall of 2021. And then there are elections in 2022. And, you know, we know that they're in November, but of course there are primary elections before that and candidates need to 
collect signatures and get on the ballot before that. So this is all going to need to play out um, fairly quickly. Um, and so I, that, that litigation will ultimately um, be critical in determining what the, the district lines are for the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question here about how to bring, uh, how could a person bring attention to you about issues that concern them without a full lawsuit. Um, her example is, uh, I can't order pepper spray for my teenage daughter who works late hours as a waitress, but, but other issues as well. Yeah, so first we have, um, what I mentioned our sort of, uh, some of what we do relates to our, our, what I call our public facing role, which is uh, having meetings like this, having uh, dialogue with members of the legislature, with law enforcement officials, advocating for legislative policy. And, and one of the things we do is we receive uh, correspondence from, from Wisconsinites uh, and actually from people all over the place. Um, and you can contact our office by email, uh, you can call our office or, or you can write us a letter. Um, you can just go to our website and there's, there's contact uh, information on, on the uh, Wisconsin, Department, Wisconsin Department of Justice website. Uh, so you can reach out to us with an issue and we've got a process that routes the correspondence we receive to uh, the relevant person in our office. Sometimes that means it comes to my desk. Uh, sometimes it, it means it goes to somebody who's an expert in a particular area. Um, and ultimately um, we then respond to that, that uh, correspondence. If it's an issue that involves legislative change, we, we do weigh in on those issues sometimes though certainly contacting your, your state representative and your state senator um, is sort of the most direct way to uh, attempt mm -hmm. to make legislative change. But, um, but, but I encourage uh, people to reach out to our office if they have uh, questions or concerns. Okay, good to know, thank you. Um, do all, someone asks, do all prisons offer drug addiction therapy? If you can. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna give you a caveat first before I go into this, which is that um, although our office often does work in connection with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Corrections is the agency that oversees prisons in Wisconsin and, and Kevin Carr, who's the uh, DOC secretary is the head of that agency currently. Um, my understanding though is that uh, there is a, a program that's available for AODA or alcohol and other drug um, addiction treatment through the Wisconsin prison system. Uh, it is not nearly as expansive as I would like, or I believe that Secretary Carr would like. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, well, there are a few reasons, but the primary one is, is lack of resources to um, provide the treatment that people need. Um, the concerns I have, there are a couple concerns I have with, with the way that program is currently set up. Um, one is, like I said, there's just not as much availability as I would like to see, or I think others would like to see. Um, and that, that's where the resources piece uh, really comes in and, and it's significant. And the second problem is it's set up so that the treatment happens at the end of somebody's term of incarceration. Um, and the idea is we want somebody before they re-enter the community to receive the, the treatment that they need. Um, so I understand why it's set up the way it is, but um, when people enter our prison system with substance use disorder, um, we should be getting those folks treatment immediately and throughout their term of incarceration because, uh, you know, the notion that treatment is something that can happen in somebody's final months in prison uh, and that it's going to address the issue long term, I, I think is one that we, we know is not correct. And so um, I would like to see uh, expanded uh, support for, for treatment resources in our, our correction system. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, the challenges always is you know, where, where resources end up getting spent and where they get invested. Um, but my view is it's the right thing to do for people who end up in our prison system, but it's also the right thing to do again for, for public safety. This is another example of this issue. The vast, vast majority of people who are incarcerated in Wisconsin prisons end up uh, leaving incarceration and um, re-entering our, our communities. And it is in the interest of public safety as well as the interest of the person who's getting treatment to help those folks uh, address the addiction or, or the mental health challenge um, that may have led them to, to being involved in the criminal system in the first place. Thank you. There's two questions related to the legislature and let me see if I can combine them a bit. 
Uh, the first one asks about um, what the legislature did to re restrict your power and authority uh, for you and your office. And then as well, um, how has a lame duck session with the le legislature um, requiring you to govern uh, you and the governor to seek permission from the legislature affecting your jobs? And how are other states handling that? To note. So I guess just to go back for those who, um, and I, it looks like my internet connection may have slowed down there for a minute, but for those who didn't follow this at the time in, um, I was elected and the governor Evers was elected in November of 2018. And in December of 2018, the legislature, uh, well, uh, Scott Walker was still governor, met in uh, an extraordinary session, and they passed uh, sweeping legislation that uh, restricted the powers of both the governor's office as well as my office in certain ways. Um, the one uh, generally speaking involve settlements or resolutions of cases. Um, one of the provisions uh, prevents our office from uh, resolving certain cases that are being um, prosecuted or enforced by by my office without approval from a legislative committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another one limits the way that we can resolve cases where the state is a, a defendant um, in certain circumstances. Um, those restrictions have, they, they've done a few things. One is uh, they impact the way that we can litigate cases because if if a case is resolved before a suit has been brought, the legislation doesn't apply. Um, but if it's been brought, if, it's, if, it, if it is a case where the suit has been brought, then uh, in some circumstances, the legislation does apply. And so uh, it creates sort of odd incentives. Uh, for example, it gives us this incentive to resolve cases prior to suit. Um, where a suit has been brought though, it slows down the process of resolving a case, which is not in anybody's interest because uh, the defendant in the case if, if they have agreed to a settlement, they want the case to end on those terms. And it's not in the state's interest either as we're enforcing our laws, because if we're enforcing environmental laws, as an example, um, when we resolve those cases, that allows our, our assistant AGs to move on to the next case to make sure that they're enforcing uh, other environmental violation uh, or other you know, violations of environmental law or other consumer protection laws. Um, they can't do that as efficiently if they've got, if they get hung up um, with with a legislative committee. It also creates an issue because uh, it requires a, a, a process um, where information that may be confidential as a settlement is negotiated has to be provided to a committee. And, th and that's created real hangups in getting cases resolved because in some circumstances, a company may not wanna make a settlement offer if it knows that it's gonna become public prior to agreement. And so it can inhibit our getting cases resolved. Um, so that process has been unnecessarily complicated. It doesn't serve the state's interests. The other thing they did is they limited, they made changes to the way that settlement funds are allocated. And there's an ongoing dispute between my office and the legislature about that. But, um, but it has had the effect of being much like a budget cut uh, on our office mm -hmm. uh, in a way that limits our ability to uh, use funds to uh, advance the goals of our office. And there's, like I said, there's an ongoing dispute about uh, those funds. So we'll see how that ultimately plays out. Um, but, but those things have in, inhibited our ability to resolve cases and to, uh, to use resources that prior AGs could have used to, uh, to advance the, the work of the Department of Justice. My goodness, thank you. That's more than we see elsewhere in print. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, there is someone who has their hand up and I'm gonna read one more question then we'll go to that person. Um, someone here is concerned about the disparity in prosecuting uh, nonviolent marijuana offenses. How can we lobby for the release of those in jail in light of disparities with uh, due to race? Yeah, there are, there are a few um, things I would, I would mention. One is, um, Data shows that there are disparities in, in marijuana convictions um, in Wisconsin. Um, the DA from Milwaukee County, John Chisholm, uh, recently released some data that his office had gathered uh, showing where those disparities arise. And um, one of the things his data showed, and I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but at, at a very general level, um, a number of years ago, and I forget exactly how far back it is, 
um, the disparities in convictions for, for marijuana uh, possession were, were significantly higher than they are currently. I think it was something like 10 to one um, black to white disparity in convictions. Um, that has dropped, it's moved in the right direction. I believe it's now more like four to one. And one of the things that John's data showed is that uh, that's actually now not primarily because of Milwaukee County. Um, his office has significantly reduced marijuana um, prosecutions, marijuana possession prosecutions. Uh, so the decrease we've seen in the disparities is, is, is basically attributable to what Milwaukee County has done. Um, and by and large, those disparities are resulting from the, the rest of the state. Um, so one thing to do is to raise awareness about, about this issue. And you can do that in a number of ways, whether it's through forums or through um, contacting your legislators mm -hmm. or um, you know, reaching out to other people who are, are concerned about that issue. Um, and, and then advocating for, for your legislators to address these issues from a policy standpoint uh, is critical as well. Uh, more broadly, uh, you know, Wisconsin has significant uh, racial disparities in, in our criminal justice system. We have the highest black male incarceration rate of any state in the country. Um, and that is a huge problem that we need to work to address. And there are lots and lots of ways that I think we can work to address that. A, a good example, I talked about some issues before that I thought made our communities safer and made our uh, system fairer. But uh, another good example is the way we go about uh, policing communities. I am a huge proponent of community policing. I, I believe that when law enforcement officers know those in the communities where they're working, uh, they get better information. Uh, so they have a better understanding of what, you know, who may be responsible for violent crime in a community or who may be a, a drug kingpin. Uh, and they also get a better understanding of who's not actually a, a danger um, in a way that is harder to get when you're more removed from uh, the community where you're conducting law enforcement operations. I think you also get fairer outcomes when you have that kind of model because you can target people who are committing the significant crimes rather than having wide scale arrests that may not actually get to the, um, the individual or the individuals who are the, the root of a, a violent crime problem, for example. Um, so continuing to advocate for um, more effective law enforcement strategies and more effective um, policies in general. I mentioned bail reform before, um, you know, there are certainly others. One other area I think is important to mention is making sure that we are enforcing in areas where historically there's been under enforcement. Um, I mentioned the lack of uh, effective enforcement involving uh, in crimes involving violence against women um, previously. And, and I think we've made enormous strides in that area, but I certainly think there's uh, more progress to be made. Um, civil rights enforcement is another area that uh, I think is critical. I'm an advocate for um, granting significant civil rights enforcement authority to our State Department of Justice. Uh, and, and cases involving white collar crime also, I think, have historically been under enforced. And so uh, making sure that we are appropriately enforcing in areas where there's been under enforcement uh, but using um, smarter strategies that are more effective at reducing crime and disparities um, in other areas, I think, is, is the right combination. Uh, and reaching out to your legislators, writing letters to the editor, um, raising awareness at, at forums and other group meetings, those are all good ways to, um, to, to move the ball forward on these issues. Thank you so much. Dennis, you had a question. I see your hand is raised for a while. Yes. Uh... Thank you so much for your presentation. I got to say that I feel a lot better with you and uh, Governor Evers at the top than what we had before. Uh, so um, uh, you mentioned that you're involved with the law enforcement services and um, uh, given uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the defund police uh, uh, calls for that, um, uh, are you involved with uh, dealing with things like uh, um, banning the chokeholds, uh, et cetera, um, and also in uh, police training. So uh, they know more about de-escalation techniques and maybe have having social workers and people like that deal with uh, particular issues rather than uh, police that aren't very trained very well to do that. Yeah, there, so there are um, sort of a variety of criminal justice reform efforts that are happening around the state and um, the, the, the short answer is that we are uh, involved in those discussions. Um, 
there's, uh, I'll, I'll sort of give you a quick summary of the three main ones that I sort of see going on right now. One is the governor has issued a, a variety of proposals for legislative change. Uh, second is that uh, Speaker Voss has created a task force um, that's reviewing various policies and considering uh, proposals. Uh, and then a, a group of state senators um, that includes uh, Van Wangard, uh, Lena Taylor, and uh, I believe a third senator um, has, has made some proposals as well. Um, there are a couple of things I think are important to note. One is I, I do think there is likely to be legislation that bans chokeholds unless it's required um, because of an imminent threat to somebody's life or, or a threat to serious bodily injury. That is not something that uh, Wisconsin officers are trained on currently. So it's not part of the training um, and, uh, and nor do I think it should be or there's certainly no, nobody who's advocating for adding it to, to the training. Um, so the legislative proposals would be to uh, create a prohibition um, there are also elements of uh, what's generally known as de-escalation um, in the, the law enforcement training. It focuses on using um, a continuum of force. And so you increase force depending on um, the circumstances and, and the conditions. I, I do think though that we should also expand um, training that focuses on, on de-escalation so that it's, uh, it's, it's, it, some of those concepts are part of the current um, required training for new officers, but I'd like to see expanded training so that it's, there's more continuing education for officers um, on, on de-escalation as, as one example. Um, I also think that uh, there are a variety of things we should be looking at um, uh, for, from a policy standpoint as we assess um, how we move forward um, on some of those issues. So I I mentioned before that there are sort of a, a variety of proposals out there. Um, I think that there will be some change that, that results from that. Um, how much there will be will, you know, in significant part come down to uh, what the legislature ultimately decides to, um, to go with there. I do think though, I'm, I'm of the view that we need to do more investment um, rather than less. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a few reasons I think that's the case. Um, first, there has been significant disinvestment in a lot of social services in our communities. And one of the things that's a real challenge for, for law enforcement agencies is that there is often nobody to call except for law enforcement to respond to issues. Uh, and so you, you mentioned um, certain circumstances where you might want a social worker to respond. The, the problem in a lot of communities is that there, there is no social worker. And so when somebody is in a mental health crisis, it's often law enforcement who gets called to respond. So I'd like to see more critical incident uh, training, for example, so that officers who are responding to those issues are, are prepared to do it. Um, but we've also suggested, and we work with a broad coalition to do this, including um, law enforcement agencies uh, or groups that represent them, uh, for expanding uh, a variety of programs for responding to mental health crises. Uh, the, the system we have right now is, in my view, not effective. Um, and one thing I would like to see is some, some pilot programs that involve uh, at least in part a non-law enforcement response to crisis, um, both so that if it's a situation where you don't need to have somebody who's uh, armed responding, you can have somebody who's tra a trained social worker or a trained psychologist, mm -hmm. but also because I think having follow-up with individuals who have mental health crises by somebody who is a professional in that area uh, will reduce the number of, of people who end up um, coming back in, in the cycle over and over again. Um, so I do think there's an opportunity for investment there. We've got a, the group that we, we have, um, there's a broad coalition involves, like I said, law enforcement groups, uh, advocates for uh, folks with uh, mental health issues. That includes the Wisconsin Hospitals Association and Counties Association and the Public Defender's Office. Um, and, uh, you know, we I forget exactly when we put it out, but we certainly can follow up with information about that. But the goal is to, both improve the emergency detention process, but also to divert more cases away from emergency detention into less restrictive environments so that people who don't need that kind of intensive intervention are able to get treatment uh, at a level that's appropriate for their needs. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, just want to let everyone know we have 14 more questions coming up here, which may be able to uh, be combined or whatever, but I don't think we have all day. So I would say, I'm not gonna go back to people who wanted to add something or clarify something. I don't think we just can do that and not cover some of the other questions, which seem to all be on different topics. So not too repetitive. This one has is, is concerned with voting uh, uh, legislation that has been passed recently by Georgia and maybe other states that um, are really uh, devastating the impact, uh, have a devastating impact on voters' rights. Uh, wondered if Wisconsin legislature is considering this or if they do, what is the Department of Justice uh, position on this issue and what would your role be in um, handling uh, any situation regarding voting um, restrictions? Yeah, the, the, the short answer is, um, and I'll, since you have so many questions, I'll try to keep my answers brief. There have been proposals that would restrict access to voting in Wisconsin in the legislature. Um, I don't know if the governor has squarely said that he would veto those, but I think he's made, it's, it's very clear that he would veto those uh, if they were to pass. And so I'm not, I'm not concerned that there will be legislation restricting voting access that is passed in this session. It doesn't mean that there won't be, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say passed, won't be signed into law by the governor. Uh, it doesn't mean they won't be passed by the legislature and that there won't be discussions. Um, our, my role is twofold. One is, um, I, you know, I am an advocate for expanding access to voting and would, you know, advocate against legislation that would restrict access. And if the governor, you know, if what, what I say and when I say it, it would depend on the circumstances. Um, given my confidence in restrictions being vetoed by the governor, I'm, I'm not concerned about those passing now. Um, but one thing that is important to note, and this is an unusual aspect of uh, the Department of Justice's role, is we, we defend uh, in court uh, state laws uh, as well as agency actions, um, generally speaking, regardless of whether I personally agree with those laws. And so if a law were to pass, it would be possible that my office would be defending it in court. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, sometimes there is a law that is just indefensible legally, and in those cases, we could uh, decline to d defend the law. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there, th there are times when there are laws that have passed that are not ones that I would have voted for if I were a legislat legislator, um, but, but the role of DOJ is to defend them. And part of the thing that's important to note about that is if we wouldn't defend statutes, that doesn't mean that they would become invalid. It would mean that the legislature would, in all likelihood, uh, or the governor would hire outside counsel uh, to come in and defend it uh, on behalf of the state. And we actually have some cases going on now where we are defending laws and the legislature has effectively said, we don't trust Josh Call to defend these. So even though they've said they're gonna defend them, we're gonna ask that outside counsel be brought in uh, mm -hmm. to defend the laws. Um, and so there's ongoing disputes about that. But, um, but generally speaking, um, you know, my expectation is that if there are laws that I'm concerned may pass that are harmful to voting access, that I'm going to speak out um, against them, but I'm also confident that the governor would veto them. Okay, thanks. Um, this is for, for Mark. There's a concern here about the, the uh, closed captioning. Are you, can you turn it off if someone doesn't want it or not sure how it no, works. They, they have to turn it off themselves. Okay, so if you are having trouble with the uh, closed captioning um, covering up on your screen too much, um, click on CC and there's a place to click on close your screen or close this option. And it might also be under more if you have that option in your computer. So. This isn't something that we can manage. It's, it's under your control. Okay, another question for Josh is, are you in favor of expanding expungement to people over 25 years of age? Do you <coughs> favor increased data transparency from the Department of Justice? Uh, yes to both questions. Um, I am in favor of expungement. There's legislation that's been proposed that I actually thought was gonna pass in the last session. 
Um, and I, if I recall correctly, it passed the assembly, but not the Senate. Um, I am hopeful that it will, it will pass this time. I think the people who, um, I, I think there are people who are, who deserve a second chance, who have uh, demonstrated that, you know, there was something that happened when they were young that was, um, it's not who they are and it was, um, and they deserve to have their record cleared um, if they meet certain criteria. Um, I, and I think data transparency is, is critical. That's, it's something we've um, worked on as uh, during my administration and we'll continue working on. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is link up data so that it, it better applies across agencies because there's sort of silos of data where the courts have certain data and we have certain data and DAs have certain data and the Department of Corrections has certain data. The more we can link that data together, uh, the better understanding we'll have of how the criminal justice system plays out and the better that we can make decisions that are based on evidence uh, and then the public can see what's going on so they can assess the decisions that are being made. Um, the, the more the data is siloed, the more difficult it is to collect that data and then to analyze it. Thank you. I, I actually, we've come to uh, the last question and um, there were just several comments and things that were also counted as questions here. So sorry to misrepresent the, the questioning. Um, I'm not sure, cause I was reading questions if you covered this, but in the question regarding um, voting restrictions, uh, do you, going across the country with, with um, would they be, is in your opinion that they would come before the Supreme Court and their creation seems to get, negate the court's previous decision on laws regarding suppressing voting? Yeah, um, so in 2013, the US Supreme Court issued a decision called Shelby County, uh, which really gutted the Voting Rights Act's pre-clearance requirement that that requirement said that in certain states and, and then in some counties, if there were changes being made to voting laws that they had to be submitted to the US Department of Justice for, for review. The court's reasoning was that the formula hadn't been updated for a long time and was outdated. Uh, so they struck it down. And I, I think that that decision has proved to be disastrous um, and has opened the floodgates for voting restrictions in, in a variety of places, including the legislation we just saw passed in Georgia. Um, it, it is definitely possible that that will end up before the US Supreme Court. Um, there, I think there's already been a challenge brought to the Georgia legislation as an example. Um, and I, you know, I think there will be other challenges brought uh, if there's other legislation passed in, in states around the country. Um, where, what, how that ultimately plays out in the court process, whether it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court or a state court, I think will vary case by case, but, um, but I wouldn't at all be surprised to see some of these challenges back before the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, um, I'm just wondering about your time. Can you take one or two more or? Yeah, I can take a couple more. Seven after. Okay, there's uh, someone who asked that uh, I had not that wishes I had not skipped something here on the questions and re asked it again. What are some of the most significant or unexpected challenges you have come across in working towards your goals for the department? I think. Um, well, you know, when, when I ran the, uh, the emergency detention, or that's sorry, the uh, extraordinary session legislation um, mm -hmm. was not something that we were uh, considering. Uh, so mm -hmm. that obviously has been, um, you know, a huge challenge in a, in a variety of ways, including that we've, we've had time and resources devoted to fighting some aspects of that legislation, which I believe to be uh, a violation of our separation of powers under the, the state constitution. Um, so that has, uh, that has tied our hands to, to some degree, uh, but we've worked hard to uh, avoid having that stop us from, from getting the critical work that we do accomplished for the people of Wisconsin. Uh, the pandemic has been a huge um, uh, unexpected crisis for people across the state. And that's no different for us. You know, we have, a, uh, like I said, about 800 people. And um, when that hit, our number one priority was to make sure that we were keeping our, uh, our staff safe uh, and not exposing people to heightened degrees of risk unnecessarily. Um, but we've also had to keep in mind that we have important work to do. You, you know, we can't stop investigating 
um, significant criminal cases or uh, testing evidence at our state crime labs or doing a lot of the other critical work that we do. And so um, we worked hard early in the pandemic to develop policies that would keep people safe uh, while also allowing us to, to continue doing the work that we've done. I'm really proud of the work that our, our team has done on that front. Uh, but we've also tried in the context of the pandemic to help other agencies uh, adjust because it's not just our work that couldn't stop. It's also victim services providers in counties around the, country, uh, the state. Uh, it's working with uh, law enforcement agencies as the governor's initial orders were put down uh, to try to make sure that they could uh, take action to protect public health and public safety. Uh, and then it's been in, in court in some cases uh, involving challenges to not only the state orders, um, but also to some local orders where we've, we've weighed in. And so as an example, shortly after the state Supreme Court struck down the Safer at Home order, I think this was back in May of last year, we put out um, a, a quick opinion making clear that that order applied to uh, the state Safer at Home order, but that counties and local governments still had authority to put um, health protections in place uh, so that they would know what, what rules they were operating under. So, so that, you know, that, that certainly was a challenge we weren't expecting, but it's one where we knew that um, the work we were doing was, was incredibly important. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is a bit of a challenge is um, I, you know, I, I knew that the political environment we had in the state was divisive and um, could be, that it would be challenging to get things accomplished. Um, but it, you know, if I'm, if I'm being honest, it's more challenging than I think I expected when I was yeah. elected. And, and what the frustration I have is not in trying to find common ground. Uh, cause I actually think there's a ton of common ground to be found out there. It's when, um, I, what I perceive as politics getting in the way of accomplishing things on issues where there's common ground. I mentioned earlier legislation that's designed to prevent a future backlog of, of sexual assault kits. You know, we got broad input on that legislation. The lead authors in each chamber were Republicans, uh, and that was not an accident. We wanted to make sure that it was bipartisan legislation. Um, like I said, it sailed through the state Senate, passed on a voice vote, uh, but the assembly refused to even have a hearing on it in the last legislative session. And, mm -hmm. you know, I perceive that not as a policy disagreement, but them not wanting to pass a bill that they knew was a priority of, of mine. And that's that's bad for the state and it's bad for the people who we serve. And so uh, that, that has been a challenge, but we continue working to pass legislation and we're not, you know, we're gonna keep trying to get things accomplished for the people of the state and uh, try to work around the obstacles that are there to the extent we can. And if we can't, mm -hmm. we're going to uh, keep raising public awareness about it and try to pressure people to act. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that was a good question because we learned a lot with your answer. Thank you. Thank you. One last question, and that's Dennis, who has his hand up again, and um, and that'll that'll close our 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 conversation with you today. Then, Josh. Okay, Dennis. I oh, uh, I didn't realize I had my hand up again. Um, oh, yeah, I'm from Kiwani County, and um, I'm uh, concerned about what kind of enforcement you have against uh, these big concentrated animal feedlock. There's a uh, I think there's a dairy farm up there with 5,000 cows and it's been contaminating the groundwater. So uh, can you say anything about enforcement of environmental standards and these kind of operations? Yeah, I mean, Kiwani County has been impacted by um, runoff from CAFOs probably more than anywhere in the state. And uh, it's not, but it's not only Kiwani County that's been impacted. It's been other parts of Northeast Wisconsin. It's been parts of Southwest Wisconsin. And, you know, where I come at this issue is that I think it's vital that we protect clean air and, and clean water in Wisconsin, in particular, that we make sure that no matter where you live in Wisconsin, you have access to safe and clean drinking water. Um, it's important for the obvious reason, which is that it's critical to people's health that the water they're drinking is safe. But it's also important because part of what makes Wisconsin such a great place to live is that we've got fantastic recreational opportunities, including you know, more lakes than Minnesota. Um, and uh, it's, it's critical to economic development. P companies don't move to places where they can't rely on safe drinking water. Um, it causes jobs to leave. And so the idea that there's an economic reason to uh, allow a, a CAFO to destroy a waterway is just false. There are sort of two challenges, I think, um, that we face in protecting clean water. One of them is an area that, that is within our, our ambit. One of them is less so. 
The one that, that really is part of what we do is enforcing the laws when they're violated. Um, you know, I, I, in my view, we have really changed the way we go about enforcing uh, environmental violations and are now doing it in a way that's more effective and more fair. Um, I don't think that that was the case, um, uh, you know, under my predecessor's administration, um, but we still face a resources challenge. We have fewer people at DOJ doing that enforcement work and uh, fewer people at DNR doing that work than I would like to see. And um, that's something that takes time to rebuild those, those units. Um, and it takes support in the budget ultimately um, to do more of those, that work. But I've, I've been really proud of the way we've strengthened our, our enforcement effort. Um, and I think actually we're beginning to see it more now than the day we came into office because it's, it's not as simple as just flipping a switch. You've got to have DNR go back to really investigating the cases, getting the evidence together, putting the legal case together, filing suit and, and ultimately getting resolution. So that's part of it. It's also, by the way, critical for businesses that are doing the right thing and following the laws because they deserve a level playing field to compete on. Mm -hmm. Now, the second issue, and this is where we have less direct authority is on the policy side um, because some of these, you know, some of these CAFOs are violating the permits that they have in place. And that's when we bring an enforcement action, but some of them have been granted permits that allow them to engage in conduct that, you know, uh, a lot of people may think is problematic in the first place. If they're doing that in a way that's consistent with the permit, we don't have authority to go in and say, you can't do that. Um, and so, so on a policy side, uh, making sure that DNR has the authority to, um, to only issue permits if it's safe for the, the environment and, for, uh, and, and then they can protect clean water in doing so is where we also need change. And that requires you know, legislative action. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's a reason to keep pressure on the legislature. The good news is this is an issue that there is pressure being felt because in the last session, uh, you know, Speaker Voss created a task force on clean water. Uh, they didn't ultimately pass anything as a result of the work, at least through the Senate, the assembly passed some legislation. Um, but it's an issue that people are clearly hearing about because otherwise I don't think there would have been a, a task force created. So I continue, uh, I encourage you to continue raising awareness um, about the, the critical need to protect our clean water. Thank you. Um, I don't want to close without uh, Mark. If you have some closing comments you'd like to bring. No, not, not, nothing other no than uh, thank you so much for uh, being willing to do this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Thank you. Yay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be able to talk with you this morning. And, um, and I appreciate all the, the thoughtful questions and, and the dialogue. So thank you. Yes. Keep up the good work. Yes. Thanks, Susan, for all her help. She was tremendous. So thank you. In your office, she, Susan oh, Lee, great. I think. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah thank sure. you.